morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. I'm Larry Sashin. Today, we've uh, compiled a great panel to discuss culinary education trends in 2024. You know, we have been listening since the pandemic uh, that every restaurant is one or two people short of being able to put on a, a great full service. Well, okay, okay. But the people you see here are the people who will be bringing the fuel that will power the food service engine from here on. So, but before we start, um, we have to say hello to the people who are paying the bills today. So first we'll talk about produce experience. They are the importers of fine herbs, salads, and tropical fruits. If quality is something you really need for your restaurant, look to produce experience. And expense reduction analysts, hey, restaurateurs, distributors, manufacturers, there is gold in those invoices that you just count the number of boxes, count the number of deliver in the delivery, and stick on a, a pin. Uh, if you want to save money, if you want to reclaim money, call expense reduction analysts. So back to our show. Before we start, let's go around the room and say hello. Uh, Tim, why don't you start? Hi, I'm Tim Bozinski. I'm an assistant professor in hospitality and restaurant management at the Culinary Institute of America. And uh, <clears throat> I've been there for a number of years, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Joyce. Good morning, everyone. I'm a uh, senior uh, contributing writer for Total Food Service and their news editor. Thank you. And Karen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Karen Goodlad, and I am an associate professor at New York City College of Technology. I am also the chairperson of the department. And shout out to the students that are here. Great. And audience, welcome. We, uh, as I said in the past, we want you to participate. If you have something to say, wave, jump up and down, text Fred or myself, and we will bring you into the conversation. So, Fred, you said you wanted to ask the first question. Go ahead. Well, uh, all we've heard about over the last year is the <laughs> shortage of folks that we have coming into the industry. Um, I feel like we're being quote unquote, threatened to some extent by the addition of robotics and automation into the industry to replace people. Uh, I'm not sure that's where I'd like to see hospitality go. Uh, so I think the big question is, today we're represented on the panel at one end by, you know, what's considered the Harvard of the, in of the industry, the Culinary Institute of America. And at the other end, we have this incredible city tech program that's generated so many incredible people. My question is, what is the role of, it, of, of education going forward? And what opportunities are going to be there for this next generation of graduates coming into the industry? So, Karen, um, love to get the panel's thoughts on that. <laughs> you are the grassroots. Uh, you are the grassroots. Why don't you start? Wonderful. Well, um, thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Um, look, it, we talked about automation, right? You started with automation and it's real and young people want it more than older people want it. Um, we were talking about it in class yesterday about you know, hotels, walking in and just punching in rather than greeting somebody. But I think that that interpersonal interaction is absolutely necessary and why we need culinary and hospitality education. Um, the prospects are there. Um, a few things that I've seen in the industry and, and especially with students is yes, we're fewer. One, you know, there's no doubt about that. That's fewer. And, and for those organizations that are only too short, then let's celebrate that because so many are even more short. But the people that are here, the students that are in classes are dedicated they're desiring and they're going to create the opportunities they're the ones that are going to be innovating for the future so is there a future for hospitality education hospitality graduates 100 okay okay uh tim can you add to that please yeah i mean i'll i'll um pick up exactly where karen left off in the sense that uh, this is an industry that will always i always want to have um 
human beings involved in it. It's just the nature of the business itself and and the industry. There is there's certainly no um, replacing the human element that's involved in the hospitality as much as we can automate you know certain things. Um, you know the the human side of it is is hugely important and impactful, and so we're always going to have um, opportunities there. And I think that um, education in that in and around that is is just building more towards some of those more specific ideas almost, and getting more of those um, focuses on um, how to improve hospitality. Um, at least that's what uh, I think I'm seeing. So I, I think there's this constant opportunity for that to be true. Yeah, yeah, you know, we're 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 stuck right now on this uh, this automation thing. Um, way back in the day, when you used to go to the grocery store, you had a relationship with the checkout person, you had a relationship with the butcher, you had a relationship with the uh, the produce guy. Now you have checkout lines, you know, these self service checkout lines, and basically what what we see is a few things. Number one, the store is cold and hard, and and number two, there's a lot of theft. Because mm -hmm. people have found a way to stick two things in one bag. Uh, so um, I think hospitality, although they can pick up automation in certain areas, there has to be a happy medium someplace where it doesn't step on that interpersonal relationship. Peter Herrero, uh, un unmute yourself for a second, please. Sure. So sorry. I, don't, don't be sorry. Don't oh. be sorry. Peter. Yes. You're, you're Mr. Hospitality. Talk about that for a second. Um, I got to tell you, I'm excited about our industry is number two in the United States of volume and business. Mm -hmm. We could use automation. Uh, our people uh, could actually make more money, be better trained. Um, it's an exciting time. So it, it's just, I will tell you, I don't know how to do it. I'm, I'll be the first to, to tell you I'm not the best at automation um and i don't know how we're going to apply it it's going to be slow and it's going to be a bumpy road but it's hard the culinary schools are fighting marketing schools and and so many other things uh, the trades are coming back slowly um it's hard I i'm part of westchester community college and alumni and uh, on their culinary advisory council and it's really hard it's not even the money to get into college anymore Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm finding it challenging. These kids have so many options, which is great. Mm -hmm. Things mm -hmm. that you and me and most of the people on this panel could never imagine. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have this many opportunities or options. And half of them, here, I'll make you laugh. I shaved. I, I've had a beard for 40 years to show three team members how to grow a beard. Because they three young men don't know how to grow a beard. <laughs> There's so many skills that are being lost. I, I, I think it's an exciting time, but it's confusing. Yep, mm. I agree with you, Peter. Well, you know, well he, he, here's a question for the panel. Do we, do we begin with the back of the house, meaning the, yes. traditional, the traditional dishwasher, the traditional uh, guy or gal working on the fry line, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, which used to be filled by, a, by an a, an immigrant or somebody who was starting at the beginning of the chain, et cetera. And now we don't have access to that piece of the labor force. Do we start there? And then how as we train our managers and chefs going forward, how do we train them to integrate those skills into what it is they're trying to execute every day? And how do we do that in the education process? Joyce, you want to speak to that? So many of the, students and young people that come into the industry, and Yvonne will attest to that, I see he's in the audience, uh, don't know what it is to spend a day in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they need, what the skills are, what the personal skills are, the technical skills, in order to survive in a career that they begin maybe in high school if they, they do get a, a part-time job. They have a passion, but the role of education is to provide and explore with them the options that they have, what's needed for all the individual 
uh, 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 jobs that are out there, and then to help mentor them and to help them move up uh, as well as become good people who can work in a team, who can talk to other people. Yeah. With uh, AI and the robotics, we're losing that hospitality, uh, talking one-on-one, -on -one, um, being in, in the same, you know, the same room. Um, there, that change is going to be very difficult. If you look back at when McDonald's started and they became an automated restaurant, mm -hmm. they still emphasized hospitality when someone walks in and says, may I take your order? And we're now in a new revolution of, well, how is that? Maybe taking your order is not as important because the menu is pretty clear um, in, you know, unless you're going into a, um, a fine dining restaurant. But the elements of hospitality, we all use in our personal lives. We all use and take those things that we've learned into if, you, if, if someone decides not to stay in that industry. I know a young lady who started out in the industry and learned how to be hospitable. And now she recruits doctors and she says, thank God I have that training because I'm able to chat with, you know, with people that need to know uh, how and what uh, their roles will be in a, in a new environment. And, and that's, that's why even Karen will agree with me. We believe mentoring is yeah. one of the big components <laughs> and, and the, and the young people need to go to a school, community college or a CIA, because they'll then be also learning how to talk the language of uh, our industry and knowing they'll be talking about that 10 hours a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, you hey, Tim, Tim, hold on a sec. Tim, what's the CIA doing to adapt to what the change that's ahead? Well, I need to get more clarification of, of what you're thinking about in terms of the movement away from. Yeah, I, I think what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about is in the back in the back of the house, which yeah. traditionally had uh, chefs and shoe chefs and cooks. Yeah, I'm talking about the elimination of many of those positions, right? Uh, by automation, specifically with very with what I perceive to be very little change in the front of the house in terms of it's still touch and feel with people. Well, I think the the big difference is we're not going to go away from skills, the basic uh, abilities to manage to do preparation and all of those things. In fact, we're we're definitely looking at at how to improve some of those those things. Um, but we're also heavily focusing in on, <clears throat> and we kind of have kind of dabbled, danced around this a little bit about more of these concentrations so that people have a little bit more specialized kinds of elements. So there's a specialization or a concentration in hospitality and there's other types of cuisines and different types of degree programs. We're also having, uh, we've also started a lot more master's programs as well to really kind of like move people up into the next sort of like tier um, so that they, if they want to just go out and be a, a really great cook and a really great uh, chef at some restaurant, they can they can come to us and do that. But we can also hopefully take them into the management tier or some other aspect. Because the other thing about it is, in my view, this is a really big industry. It, it's not the way it was when some of us went through, where it was like the only thing you were going to do is you were going to go work for La Bernadette or, um, you know, Charlie Palmer or something like that. That's not the case anymore. There's so many different types of careers and different ways to impact the industry. So, so talking about a different career path, Liz, could you unmute yourself for a second? All right. Liz good morning. The, good morning, Liz. Liz started in the industry as a photographer. Uh, she's now the largest off-premise caterer in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking independent. about the, independent. Independent. Okay, independent. Sorry, left out a word. Um, we're, we're talking about educate culinary educational trends and the conversation has moved uh, to automation versus uh, touch, you know, close touch. You, you're, I, 
I, I toured your, your facility and I think it's a perfect marriage between the two. Um, can you talk on that subject a little, please? Of automation back of house? Yes. Um, you know, I think we've been slowly getting there over the last several decades when you see what machines can do, you know, in terms of slicing and dicing and, or what you get from Baldor because you can't stop progress and at volume, it's ludicrous for anybody to think that, you know, that's stupid brunoise. I look at brunoise of vegetables and if they're done by hand, you know, I, I, I go ballistic because it's just <laughs> not worth it. Um, mm. But, but that's, that's silly. Um, it, it, it's here, it's here. And, and, you know, it's going to be the way we embrace change and we embrace technology and understand where we shift our people power is going to be parallel with AI. Um, and that's coming at us even faster. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, I, and, and I think, you know, talk about, C, you know, CIA, what we're teaching our, our, the, the, the students there, there's such a universe around food um, that, that begins, obviously, in the kitchen, but, but then goes out in so many different ways and to the nonprofit world to the for-profit world i mean it's it's, it's i and i don't i think cia could do even more to to to, to burst open the landscape because uh, there there's just so many ways that 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 people can be involved so i i agree but i think we also have to Let's not leave out the C, uh, the C caps and the and, and the city tax of the world, because for every grand chef, there's a hundred other people in the food service industry that need some training. What are you doing over at City? Uh, uh, Larry, uh, Larry. A, a yeah. thousand, not not thousand. not one, thousand. a thousand, because you thousand. can add uh, half a million migrants. Yes, yes. Or, or and and that's that's really unfair because maybe they should all be doctors, but. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's a great entry. What the best thing of what I've loved about hospitality, and then I'm going to mute myself again. You see, you unmuted me. Um, is is that it's such a wonderful way to come into an industry? I came in with a tray in my hands. That's all I knew about hospitality is how to serve. Um, so it's such an important portal, and 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 how we, you know, make. You know, grow the portal and give people skills, taking away some of the drudgery that machinery can do. I think we could probably solve that. Yes, yes. You know, the, the thing was, and, and Peter would, would, would attest to this, he started as a dishwasher and now owns a, a hospitality mm -hmm. company. Um, if the dishwasher no so, longer so exists, my question, where do people start? Larry, so my question for people like Karen are, if those dishwasher jobs aren't there anymore, and there's a and, and cutting vegetables aren't there anymore. And there's a real good chance they're not going to be there anymore. Then what has to happen at the at the education level in order to prepare people for the jobs that are going to be there? Yeah. Well, look, uh, uh, part of our vision statement is preparing leaders and dynamics of the hospitality industry for an ever changing world. Right. We have. Um, I was just talking to a couple of graduates that graduated, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and they're doing very different things than what they anticipated they would do when they were in college. But we can all say that, and that's every industry. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Uh, reading, writing, math, right? So those people that maybe would have been cutting vegetables are now needing to prepare requisitions um, of the vegetables that are already pre-cut, right? So um, John Karangas is um, the uh, executive chef for Shake Shack. And uh, we took students on a tour there and they were preparing um, future menus, right? So we were actually, you know, I was there with 15 students and we're taste testing a menu that would not come out for about 12 to 18 months. But one of the challenges was, well, if we want to put edamame into a salad, is there enough edamame for us to get? If we want shallots cut this way, is there enough for us to get? So those people that are working at Shake Shack and building a career through the ranks of Shake Shack are needing to consider how much do I need? Where am I going to source it from? And then how am I going to ensure that the skilled or unskilled laborers that are in the back of the house, right? Some are coming in with no culinary education at all, high school diplomas and, 
thank goodness for people that are, um, you know, graduating from CCAP and going right into the industry, right? But those skills are going to be math and reading and writing based and requisitions and such like that. And the reality is, is that a lot of students are coming in and they're not college level to do the math, reading and writing. So what do we do? We bring in tutors. We have um, a curriculum that is a co-curriculum, right? So students that are just about math ready will have a math course plus some extra tutoring. Um, at City Tech in the hospitality department, well, in City Tech in general, students must graduate with four writing intensive courses, but we want more. So our students graduate with six. So that's what we're doing, making sure that their overall skills are available. Thank you. Julio, unmute yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Julio Garcia from Produce Experience. I do the uh, business development here. Um, we also do, one of the things we do is we do a lot of consulting to uh, food service distributors and to restaurants. And the first thing we talk when we talk about hospitality is we talk hospitality starts in the, in the, in the home. Mm -hmm. So from the time you walk into a restaurant, you want to feel like you're welcome. Wow. That's our first step is always the first thing. You, you only have one chance to make a, a, a great first impression. Mm -hmm. So it starts there and then when you guys, when you guys were talking about fresh cut, this is something I can attain to because this is something that we don't do yet, but we will. Fresh cut uh, is usually done by machines. It's not people chopping onions. It's all done machines. So the cut on the onion is all different. Um, you know, it's it's not the same as if somebody were, you know, certainly somebody had gone to CIA or whatever culinary school would cook. Automation is good for um, Subway. You know, they have this mise en place, they're huge, and they have all different kinds of sliced and diced stuff. But look at the kids that they're hiring at a subway as compared to, say, um, like um, Tim said, Laverna Dan or, or somebody like that, where it's important that your diced shallot be exactly the same. You're paying for it, you know. So in in my industry, yeah, we, we look for... Um, shortcuts to help lower your food costs. Fresh cut is not necessarily there yet. It's very expensive. It's very expensive and it's not a perfect science. You don't know exactly how many onions you're gonna need. And there is there are perishables. There are also things that they add to fresh cut to keep them fresh, you know, so that they don't spoil quick. So that might be something that restaurants you might need some fresh cut, you know, sliced mushrooms maybe or something that, you know, but for the most part, you need the skill in the back. You need an apprentice. Go into any kitchen. Like Larry said, there's one chef, there's an executive chef, a sous chef, and then there's 20 apprentices, you know, who can do everything just as good as the other two guys. Okay. Thank you, Julio. Um, so uh, in your experience with this, uh, Back to what Fred said, how do we get these people in? How do programs expand? Uh, what, what's CCAP doing, Joyce? CCAP, for those who, of you who don't know what it is, is Careers Through Culinary Arts Program. It was founded in 1990 with Richard Grousman. I joined him to launch it. <clears throat> and there were some basic things that the program was offering. Um, those, those basic uh, items have not changed. As Karen said, um, you know, reading, writing, math, making sure that uh, the students understand all those elements as well as basic techniques and skills needed in both the back and the front of the house. And then what they're doing now, um, they recently got a grant from the state uh, to teach uh, immigrants uh, to cook, um, which is wonderful. Um, and, and they partner with other organizations and colleges uh, to give the students real experiences so that they understand the world that they'll be walking into um, and feel natural and comfortable um, in, in the industry. Um, okay. So... Go ahead, Karen. It may, may I add to that? 
Um, because uh, I'm actually at work right now, and just down the hall, we have 16 CCAP students here right now. Um, so this is a relatively new program. We've had a very, very long relationship with CCAP, but um, we needed to identify different ways to entice students to come, right? And to um, think about city tech as a viable option to support them in their careers. So uh, 16 are here, two are already committed, and they're just like excited to be a part of this. And then a few others are like making decisions about, you know, what they want to do. And and two of them were like, I don't even know if college is for me. So that opens up opportunities like community college, right? Mm -hmm. And at City Tech, students can get two degrees. You get an associate's degree um, after completing 60 credits and then um, a bachelor's degree, you know, at, at the four year ish mark, depending on, on the student's pace. So I think that working with CCAP to open up students' eyes to what the culinary education is and uh, was really important. And not only are we bringing them into the back of the house classes, because we are doing skills development. They did knife skills yesterday. Today they're doing um, different type of pastry stuff, but they're also eating in the dining room so that they can see that simulation of a fine dining experience. And they're sitting in on a hotel um, operations class and they did a workforce development class yesterday. And right now, 930, they are in an intro to hospitality class. So giving them that touch of what it means to be a college student, uh, we think is, is really important. And, and that CCAP and Food Education Fund, all these organizations that are working with high school students and trying to give them insight into what a career in hospitality management is, a career in culinary arts, pastry arts, is really, really super important um, because they are the future. Second. You know, we have somebody in the audience that can speak to CCAP uh, as well as anybody else in the country. Yvonne, Yvonne, what did CCAP do for you? Am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Uh, CCAP, CCAP kind of, exp or not kind of, definitely exposed me to the fine dining in ways that I don't think I would have been able to access on my own, first of all. Um, that's for starters. Just have, being exposed to something that, that kind of blows your mind in a way, that inspires you, that shows you, you know, you could do this, I think was the, the first thing that CCAP did. And then from there, it kind of, it, CCAP, and more importantly, CCAP is, 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 a, is a shell, right? CCAP is a program, it's an idea, but it's really the people behind it that are pushing this idea. It's the mentors, it's the teachers, it's the, the chefs that allow you the opportunity to go and be in their space and be, you know, get in the way because it's not, it's, it's not fun when you have a whole bunch of kids in a kitchen that needs to produce certain things. And it's very frustrating when you're losing product to somebody messing something up. So it really is a lot of patience, um, mentorship guidance, like that's what what CCAP at the end of the day really does. Besides the the, the uh, I guess the, the the monetary aspect of it all, you know, to to be able to provide you, like I we didn't have any money. We're we're you know we're pretty poor. So they gave me knives. You know, they gave me my first set of knives. That was incredible for me. I couldn't afford to buy the knives, so that was really great. Um, give they they actually gave us a metro card to get to and from the internships. They gave us internships to, to, or they connected us with restaurants to, so you can go work at fine dining restaurants. You know, the, furthermore, they they give scholarships. They give millions of dollars of scholarships every single year to kids that can't afford to get into culinary school just because they show a little bit of an ability to cook, or you know, even maybe not a great ability, but just a passion for it, or, or you know, they're inspired by it. So that in in. I, in a nutshell, you know, it's what CCAP did for me, and I think it does for a lot of other kids. Okay, thank you, thank you, Tim. So, La Larry, let's go back to Tim at the CIA for a second, and let's yeah. let's look under the hood for a minute. What's going on in terms of the curriculum? How is the curriculum evolving, and what types of innovative things are being done to get this next generation ready? Well, it's interesting because you asked that question, and I'm not even sure that it has to do specifically almost with curriculum to a degree, because for me, and I will I will try to go back to that, but for me, I think one of the big things that I see happening is that 
this is a generation that is coming through now that is seeing the hospitality, the the food world as a normal career, whereas most of us kind of came in kind of almost in this alternative career kind of mode and mindset. And now we're at a point where this is this is a standard career that you can do and there's no negatives around this or it's not like you're sell, you're kind of like copping out or stepping down or anything like that. So to me, I think it's about having them see this and and have them have a normal kind of experience and have this be part of the the sort of normative way of of going to school and yeah i'm going to culinary yeah i'm going to you know johnson and wales for you know english literature or something of that nature whatever it happens to be um so i think a big part of it is attracting students via that but also because of the fact that we are again creating you know, we are doubling down on definitely, you know, we, we're not going away from, you know, the basic culinary education that's going to that that we've always done for a long time. But we're definitely increasing the the specializations that are involved with that and looking at having an ability to go and travel with um, professors and, and different things. Uh, to different places or live in Spain and 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 study cooking in Spain or um, Italy or some of these other places. Um, that's a big part of what we're doing. Going to you know our Asia's cuisine, where you spend you know ten twelve days in Asia. I don't know if we've run that wow. trip since COVID, but um, basically those types of experiences where you're really kind of like. Um, immersing yourself in those areas and that's a big part of i think what we are are working with and again always trying to go up up the ladder and and more intensive education so but i think it's a combination of things yeah you guys uh the c you guys wrote a wave and and, and all education in our industry wrote a wave of quote-unquote celebrity chefs um yeah. what impact did that have and now that that's kind of has that cooled down? In other words, when people go to school now, whether it's at City Tech, whether they go to CIA, do they understand that they may not be on television and that they may not be some kind of a, a star and that it's 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 a way to make a, a great way to make a living and a fulfilling way versus becoming some sort of a, a star? Uh, you ahead. want to start, Karen? Uh, yeah, I mean we or maybe we've Joyce. Had yeah, we've had graduates that have been on Top Chef and, and things like that, but they know that that's a moment in time, right? Yeah. And they know that they need to have the skills to be able to really compete at that level or on the international scale, right? So um, at least for City Tech students, they they know that they're not. However, we are just in the midst of submitting a grant for a lot of media technology so that we can work with our students and maybe with the communications design department students to uh, bring that media aspect into um, our curriculum a little bit more intentionally. Yeah, that's that's one of the things <laughs> that's one of the things that I was going to add is students don't have to leave their home anymore mm -hmm. to experience uh, ethnic cuisine around the world with social media with TikTok. They're learning all about how to make special dishes. They're seeing uh, what's going on in the kitchen um, with um, CCAP. In order to graduate and get a scholarship, you have to compete in a, in, a, in a competition. And that's like being on Top Chef. Um, yeah. You know, so all those experiences are being offered, but I think because social media has, as you said, opened the hood and you can see behind the scenes and all the shows, Jose Andres, you know, just went to Spain. Um, you know, uh, uh, Stanley Tucci went to Italy. This exposure offers the student the opportunity to, to see what the opportunities are in the industry that weren't there um, you know, it really started with the rise of the Food Network, which started in 1991, 92. And yeah, yeah let me let me let me come jump in for a second here. We're, let's talk about the economics of all this. All right. Mm. Yvonne uh, has started with making chocolate chip cookies and ended up at, uh, at well, Le Cirque. 
he ended up at all the the storied uh, restaurants that came out. But not everybody has that 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 future in them. How did they make the jump? The immigrant yeah. families. How did they make the jump from city tech to the CIA? If you come from poor circumstances, Tim. Yeah, there is a lot of financial aid that we I have almost every student that comes to our school essentially gets financial aid. Obviously, CCAP is is one of those sources that is as helping everyone um, across the board. But there's there is a lot of 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 um, funding that is important. Is it still expensive? Yes, absolutely. It's still expensive. Um, I, I'm not going to say that it isn't, but uh, education around the country is expensive. And that's, uh, that's kind of an, uh, a thing I think that we're seeing. <clears throat> and it, it, you know, so it's not just specific to, to what we're doing. Um, but I think also, um, you know, a lot of those celebrity chefs you're just asking about, a lot of those have, you know, are, providing grants and different types of donations and different things to really help students kind of make their way into the world. And so while they have inspired a certain generation or many generations, um, I, I think now, fortunately, some of them at least are kind of giving back. And that's really um, an important part of that. And, um, you know, I think, you know, financials are always difficult for sure. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we've touched on the early development of, of restaurant uh, service people, whether it be chefs, back office, uh, back of the house, front of the house. Um, but what happens once you're in the industry and you're running your own operation? Uh, does education stop there? But Bob, Bob, why don't you unmute yourself, Bob Paranello, and tell everybody what you do and how you help the, the continuous growth in restaurants. Thank you. A pleasure being here. Uh, I own Plum Safety as a training hospitality company. I've been in the industry for a long, long time, and <clears throat> we cater to to the hospitality industry and do all sorts of certification uh, courses. I'm also a, an instructor and adjunct at CIA. Tim, we just had that allergy class a month ago. We Yeah, we, do you want me to get the book now? Yeah, you go. <laughs> we actually... Uh, provided allergen certification for about 122 of the CIA faculty and staff for continuing education to go on. But uh, a lot of operators get out in the business and they, you know, get a place open and depending on what state you're in, you may or may not need uh, official training or certification. So we, we try to continue to be available to the industry. So people who are, you know, what is it, what did it go from 20 to a hundred to a thousand people behind the scenes, behind the, that chef, there's many, many of them, uh, to get them some, you know, uh, certifications and, and tools to, to uh, prosper in the industry and maybe make a little more money and climb the ladder a little quicker. Uh, in addition, I, uh, I've been working with uh, an organization in an Orange County uh, Community College in Newburgh, New York, uh, starting out with uh, partnering with a company called uh, Food Tech. It's it's part of that curriculum. It's just about 100 miles north of the city. So that'll be good kind of hitting that that lower end sweet spot, the entry level, getting people in. Uh, and it's, it's going to have a few different paths, you know, culinary, baking, uh, processing, which is a part where we usually always just get line workers that here you go here's your machine or here's your whatever uh so to get them some micro cred credentials to when they get in there they can maybe do a little better than just you know the I'm, I'm working in the food factory or what have you so it's it's a neat program it's literally being built now so i look forward to uh that partnership and uh yeah just it's good to keep keep your uh credentials up so to speak mm -hmm. you know a lot of times in in the business the owner or somebody needs to be certified because of the health department and it's uh, unfortunately sometimes it's that owner that's mm -hmm. at the host stand and what about all the folks in the back of the house that are that are serving all the food so it's uh you know it it, it needs to go on i think it helps with employee retention and um 
and and making a, a good living because you know there's a lot of a lot of a lot of hard work into what we do. We all know that. So Bob, so Bob, there's some are there pieces from what you do that belong in everyday curriculums? What there, would, what would you what would you suggest and what would you like to see going forward be taught in our schools? Well, I I think it's funny because I I've been at CIA for uh, we'll start there like for just about 16 years and I teach food wow. safety. Um, years back, and Tim, you can attest to this. You know, there there were some entrance requirements, and it's it's yeah. been lowered over the years. So it's it's more or less if if someone's funding it, whether it's from from uh, financial help, financial assistance, or uh, the people get into the school. And I think a lot of it uh, over the past years, especially, have been because of the Food Network and Top Chef. And hey, I want to be on TV, so we get a lot of people coming in with no experience and it's a it's a it can be a rude awakening so it's uh i think getting people right up front and um uh, you know giving them that reality check before entering such a, a demanding industry i think is a benefit so um food safety as it as it were with cia uh, in, in years ago, CIA was was built on literally building blocks. You, you, everyone would take the same path through an associate's degree. But as Tim said, now we got, I can't keep up on the different bachelors and masters. It's like, oh, my God. Um, so a lot of times for uh, timeshare and, and, and having an available kitchen, sometimes people are in production before they've even gotten, you know, acclimated and, and certified in, say, food safety, which is kind of, not the best thing, right? We've, and 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 just, you know, those kind of uh, more linear paths, right? When you start out, like whether it's an immigrant or a, or, or anyone, your, your, your kid, you start out with general, hopefully being a hospitable, being a nice, pleasant person if you're in this business, whether you're in the back of the house or the front, but you pick up the broom, you learn to sweep, you learn to this, and then you, you know, I've, I've climbed my way out of the pot sink and I've done, done everything under the sun. And and there is a, a a little bit about that that's I think really enriching for anyone in this business. I mean, you you never stop being a pot washer, you know, whether you're a caterer or this or that. You're always you, you do it all. It's comprehensive. So I think that's helpful and meaningful to uh, either impart or awaken in someone before they really take that step and you know spend a lot of money and get into this business or just kind of get into it without going to school. And then learn the hard way that, wow, my God, this is this is a tough one for me. Yes, yes. Thank you, Bob. Absolutely. Pete, thank you, Pete. Uh, Pete, Pete. Thank you, Bob. Thank I you. I beat up there and I said, thank you, Pete. Uh, Charles, you've been very, very quiet today. Uh, well, I, I, this is a group that I, I appreciate. But for those of you that don't know me, I was chairman of the Dean's Advisory Board at the University of Houston for about 15 years. I still sit on that board. And I've been teaching at NYU in the hospitality program for the last 18. Wow. So I'm certainly intimately familiar with hospitality education. Um, I think that um, there's a naivete by some people that don't, don't realize evolution, not revolution. I mean, I think Karen and Joyce and Tim have spoken about it at length today, is that every day programs evolve. And they evolve for all the reasons we've spoken about. Uh, Tim mentioned financial. I mean, you know, years ago, it was inexpensive to go to college. Now it doesn't matter what program you're going through. There's scholarship money available. Um, frankly, the the attention span of students today is totally different than any of us that are that are sitting here. Um, as those of us that sit in the classroom will tell you, you're you're lucky to get a 15, 20 minute span in before you've got a break to go to something else to go back to it. You can't stand there and lecture for an hour anymore. It just you, you'd be crazy to even try. They, they'd be, you know, I have to smack one of my kids tomorrow, as a matter of fact, about <laughs> being on his phone. Um, that's, a, that's a different story. But, you know, how do you, and Tim talked a lot about this, how do you expose them to different parts of the industry? Liz mentioned, and, and a couple other people mentioned when we talked about robotics at the beginning, if you think that they're going away, you're wrong. Um, but you have to find the right use for them. And you cannot, and, and Tim said it best, you, you, you cannot expect that you're going to see robotics in the kitchen at La Bernadette. Okay. That's just not the nature of it. But yet on the other hand, if you're McDonald's, if you're Shake Shack, if you're Chick-fil-A, there is absolutely nothing wrong with robotics because there are certain tasks. Why do we want to spend minimum wage to have some poor person stand in front of a fryer 
low picking up and lowering the fryer basket, no matter how much we train them, they're going to pick it up when they shouldn't. Okay. We tell them it needs to be in the fryer basket for X amount of time. They're going to shake it and pick it up and we don't want them to let a machine do it. There's absolutely no harm in it. Um, so I think that, um, I think we're on the right track. Um, but it's not going to ever be an easy solution. And, and frankly, um, I really believe we're on the right track. Okay. Thank you. It, Any last comment? Just, for you? Go ahead. I, I just wanted to speak to that in some ways. And I think you you really touched something in my, in me in thinking that finding the best uses for that, that's where we're not at yet in the sense of running the fire basket is a perfect use for automation, a hundred percent. Right. Um, but we have to figure out what that's going to be because right now we want to use maybe automation everywhere we possibly can. We right. want to have AI do everything and it's going to take us some time before we get to a point where we're going to see appropriate and inappropriate, you know, uses of those kind of things. Uh, you know. and, and you asked the question. I want to ask. Go ahead, when you, when you use the automation, if it's not working that day, who do you call to fix it? Yeah. Do we have technicians? I mean, you know, it's just like the uh, electric cars. We don't have technicians trained. Who's doing the training for the AI uh, portion uh, and the automation portion? Do and that's a question. Any answers? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just uh, there's a company called Atosa that's right in the middle of all this automation, and clearly they're dedicated to doing the to executing the training at the local level as they install specifically uh, it'll begin with these uh, fry basket uh, robotic arms etc so I think that's where it's going to come from but is okay. it going to go into the colleges because if they can't get there within mm -hmm. two hours or three hours is there somebody on staff who will be trained? to maybe tinker yes. a little bit. Yes, or absolutely. Understand. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yep. For us, it's a different group. So we have here at City Tech, we have mechanical engineering. We have lots mm -hmm. of different tech jobs. And, you know, they'll come and those students will come and attend some of our lectures and such like that, but they're not specifically hospitality management people. So that's a completely different set. We, you know, tinker, like, okay, this is how you make it work. Look, this is the sensor. Look, it, it, you don't have to call a tech in. It's just the sensor. Clean it up. We are not teaching how to fix the equipment. You know, it's been a great show. I think we covered a lot of ground, but there's always more to cover. So maybe this could be another show sometime down the road. But before we leave, um, what I'd like to do is go around the room with our panelists and uh, give one tidbit, one takeaway that people can take home with them. Tim, why don't you start? I think the biggest thing um, for me is that hospitality is human centric one way or the other. And um, it is it is always going to remain that way. And so we are always going to be present to educate, you know, humans how to be really hospitable people. And that's, um, that's what it's all about. And if we can kind of bring that sense to the rest of our lives, that would be really wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Joyce. The education community, the colleges, the high schools, the teachers all have to be ready to help young people who have a passion for the industry and mentor them as they move uh, up into the industry and during their careers. Okay. Thank you. And Karen? Uh, embrace innovation. Don't be scared of it. Um, because what we're seeing is students are three steps ahead of, you know, a lot of us, right? Because we saw this all, all the social media stuff and like that. But yet there's a lot of technical skills that are missing. We are currently in the process of um, working through a professional development program um, for safe culinary uh, cannabis education. And we've been going and meeting with different chefs and such like that. And what we're finding is that, yes, people are working with different products and bringing cannabis into the um, you know mainstream, but the certifications are not there, the measurements are not there and such like that. So when we see these 
big change that's coming that's here it's not even coming it's here how do we make sure that we continually innovate and stuff like that so for what bob was saying earlier that workforce development that has to be a part of what we do so colleges like city tech like uh, cia can do similar things to like the cia are doing where it is you know innovating and working with different populations we should really really think about doing that because yes we need college degrees and we need people that have that but we also need those micro credentials like it was introduced to um and so keep innovating okay and fred um unionization increase of minimum wage mm -hmm. um i am i am deeply concerned and committed mm -hmm. that education has become far more important than ever before as we move forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well thank you everyone for coming today um i just uh, for those people who might be frightened by some of this conversation we had today about automa automation and uh, robots and uh, i remember as a kid we used to watch a tv program called the jetsons and they had a maid called rosie the robot who did everything and but yeah. folks rosie's not here yet uh, yeah. rosie's not here yet so there will always always and, and uh, at least in my time there will always be a need for people in a restaurant uh there has to be the human touch has got to be there and uh anybody who has an interest in in a program like ccap or or or, or, or city tech and you know everybody knows the cia um reach in you know, reach out to these people they're here to ask answer questions and um look for uh, uh the articles that come in total food about education in, in the near future and what we're going to be doing. And uh, we're going to be looking into schools, uh, hopefully one every two months or so, that will expose you to this type of uh, education classes and, and opportunities. So, uh, folks, look for us again in two weeks. Uh, we'll be back with another topic. And uh, thank everybody once again. And she's... I only have two more things to say. Everyone, stay positive, test negative, and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye now, folks. Bye.